everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast, straight here from the Miami Zoo. Hey folks, it's another exciting week. We are finishing up the Gamma videos. There was a lot of them. There are some still going up today. They're going up, I think, till halfway through this week. Then they'll all be up. Really check them out. A lot of companies made a lot of really cool announcements, so hopefully you guys will enjoy that. Tonight, I'll be doing my live Q&A. I usually do it different times each week. Tonight, I'll be doing it at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So hopefully that will allow some people to watch it who normally don't get to see the Q&A. Other than that, we have a contest winner coming up later on in the episode. We have uh, lots of different contributors and things. So let's get started with the news. So what's in the news? Really, the news has calmed down now that the Gamma Trade Show is over. Most of the big announcements have been made. Origins Game Fair event schedule is open. And by the way, some people have asked where the Dice Tower Live show is on that. It will get on there eventually. It's not on there yet. I'm, I'm currently in talks with Origins as to how that's going to get on there. Origins also announced a film festival. They're adding that whole section to Origins. I don't know. I mean, they've already been running like the, I forget what they're called. There's something similar to the Razzies where they have these, the John Smithy Awards, I think, where they like watch horrible movies and people boo them. This is not that. This is like independent films and things. And so if you have an Origins ticket, you can get in to see these movies for free. Does that complement gaming? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Um, Games Workshop has announced Lost Patrol, Death in the Jungle. This is another two-player game. They've been making a lot of these two-player games. I'm not sure what their goal is on these. This one has a, uh, the Space Marines versus the Gene Steelers. Um, it happens in the jungle. It looks pretty cool. But like all their games, you're going to have to get the miniatures, put them together. The, the models are completely compatible with Warhammer 40,000 universe. So I'm still not sure where they are on these. Like, are they trying to... Uh, you know, is, is this so people get the models and be like, ooh, I'd like to play 40K? Are these for board gamers? If so, they're pretty expensive, so I'm not quite sure. Catalyst has announced uh, several upcoming things, including their Vikings board game. Uh, you can see that on the Gamma preview. I, I had a chance actually to play it. It's very euro we kind of a pickup and delivery, go across the sea and get things and come back. Cool Mini or Not has announced Massive Darkness, which I think is coming to Kickstarter. This is going to use the rules from Zombie Side, start with those, and then be a big dungeon crawler. Cool Mini or Not is definitely trying to go toe to toe with Fantasy Flight games because this is uh, very much a direct competitor to Descent. We'll see if it is good or not. Well, of course, we'll see quite a while from now because there will be the Kickstarter later on this year, then the game will come out probably next year. April 1st, April Fool's Day, lots of stupid fake news out there, but that was a day that the asthma day, things went into effect. The good news is you can see that uh, some online stores still sell the products, um, including cool, uh, cool stuff. But um, they are not the only ones to do this. Privateer Press has also announced that they are going to be cutting out what they call like deep discount skimming. They, they, they were like, it was a pretty negative statement they made, and I'm not sure who they're going after. Here, possibly the guys who are buying it and selling it for uh, uh, rock bottom prices on Amazon. I'm not quite sure. But either way, we'll see where this goes in the future. Um, like I said, people are probably going to complain about this for a while, but we'll have to wait and see. Anyway, uh, that's the news. Let's get to the Kickstarter. Happy breakfast, everybody. Kickstarter is hopping with projects right now, so let's take a quick look at what's happening in our crowdfunding world today. Stockpile Continuing Corruption is the expansion for one of my favorite stock market games, Stockpile, which combines auctions, set collection, market manipulation, and a wee bit of push your luck. Continuing Corruption includes four different expansion modules that can be added individually or combined together. New dice can be added that randomize the forecast each round. Bonds can be purchased that provide steady interest but tie up your capital for the rest of the game. Commodities and taxes add new ways to gain bonus points but also potentially lose money. And there are a number of new investors with new abilities. Stockpile is an engaging stock market game that plays quickly but provides a nice amount of depth. $19 plus shipping will get you the expansion or for a pledge of $59 plus shipping you can get the excellent base game plus the expansion. Crown of Exile is a mix of deck building and hand and resource management. Cards that you pull into your tableau are always available to you, but you can only play four of them at a time. 
Players use your cards to build up resources and battle points with the ultimate goal of completing quests. But quests carry an upkeep, so while you need them to win, you have to make sure that you can pay for them through the end of the game. For players that prefer less direct conflict, Crown of Exile also includes rules that eliminate direct opponent attacking. The game features kind of stylized stained glass art, and while a pledge of $30 will get you the game, for $45 you can get some promo cards and upgraded wooden bits. Dice Bazaar is a light dice market game. Dice set the price of goods cards, and when you roll matching dice, you can buy one of those cards. You can also set aside dice for future turns to try to get one of those harder to get cards, but because the market changes so frequently, that's really pushing your luck. You can also use cards that you've already collected to manipulate the dice a little bit. The game comes with 38 dice, and you can get a copy for $30. Battleborn Legacy is a hefty adventure game in which you fight battles and manage your resources and complete quests. But one player had better earn enough points for victory within seven rounds, otherwise the final cataclysm hits and everybody loses the game. Battleborn Legacy plays in two to three hours, and there's a lot going on between the mechanisms of the game and the negotiations between players. There's some variability that's introduced as you mix and match heroes and races, and there's some nifty minis that are used as markers. This is publisher Silverleaf Games' first Kickstarter project, and it's an ambitious one. A pledge of $54 will get you a copy of the game. One of the games I was excited to see at Gamma was Santorini from Roxley Games. This is essentially an abstract game with a very cool and thematic presentation. In Santorini, you can move your builder one space level or up from where you are, or down as many spaces as you want. If you can get your builder to the third level of a building, you win. But if a dome caps the third level of a building, that spot is closed off for the rest of the game. This simple rule set is pretty engaging on its own, but Santorini includes at least 16 different gods that provide special player abilities that really mix it up and add a ton of variability. Did I mention that Santorini was designed by a mathematician who sometimes goes by the name of Dr. Pickle? Santorini combines strategic abstract play with beautiful art and 3D building components. This is an ambitious project to be sure, but Roxley Games is an experienced board game publisher. The pledge levels are in Canadian dollars, so a pledge of about 49 US dollars plus shipping will get you a copy of Santorini. Okay, that's all I've got for you this week. Did anything catch your eye? Until next week, play all the games. My friends, welcome back. It's good to be back. This is your Wikipedia. Now, you'll notice I've been gone the last few weeks. That is because I have been doing my top 100, and so Tom gave me board game breakfast off. But we are coming to a conclusion with that. The Wikipedia top 100 is ending this week. We've shot the number 1 through 10. It's in the can. You're going to see it soon. What will my, my number 1 be? Who can say? But it'll probably be awesome. Invariably, it'll be the greatest game ever. Now, for those of you who may have not been watching my Top 100 but are interested, feel free you can find them here on the Dice Tower channel, on my channel, over at Wikipedia. I have set up a playlist, so you can just click on that and watch the whole th thing through at one go. If you really just want to watch the Top 10, that's, I know that's what a lot of people do with these lists, then feel free, that's a great idea. But regardless, we're glad to be back on Board Game Breakfast. We'll resume traditional programming next week. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks to Tom for letting me do the Top 100. Thanks for all of you for supporting. Watch the top 10, and we'll see you next week. Hi guys, it's Breach Rate Team, breaching board games one game at a time. And I'm here finally in my new home. Well, I say it's my home, home away from home. I wish it were. The games collection is immense, over 750 games. I'm here at Luderati Cafe, Nottingham. We opened at the weekend on the 19th of March. So let's check out to see what Luderati has to offer.
Hey there, this is Mike with the Board Game Makeover. In last week's episode, I showed you how I did a minor upgrade of Planet Steam, but the biggest part of it was changing up the money with custom poker chips. In this episode, I'm going to show you how I took common poker chips and show you step by step how I turned them into custom game components. Let me show you what I do. The first thing you're going to need are poker chips. I prefer the 11.5 to 14 gram clay poker chips that you can find on eBay, and I like to buy them in bulk so I get the most for my money. You then have to decide if you want to paint the poker chips or just leave them the way they are but adding labels to both sides. Painting the poker chips takes a lot more time, but it makes the poker chip look less like a poker chip and more like a game component. I use GIMP to organize the graphic and then I transferred it to Microsoft Word so I could resize it appropriately. The poker chips are about one and a half inches wide, so I wanted to resize the graphic just a tad over one and a half so that I would not have any white border. The graphics were printed using Costco's standard photo paper. I cut the photo paper into strips so I can fit them into the punch out tool. I use Creative Memory's 1.5 inch punch out tool to give me the perfect circle. I line up the graphic inside the circle before punching it out so I know that I don't have any white border edges. Using a foam brush and Mod Podge glue makes this job faster and easier. After applying glue, center the graphic onto the poker chip. After the glue has dried, I always use either a spray or brushed on polyurethane to seal the graphic to both sides of the poker chip which also gives a nice glossy finish. Giving the poker chips a few days to dry will also allow the polyurethane smell to dissipate. Always spray in a well ventilated area using the proper safety equipment. I love taking poker chips and transforming them into quality game components. Well thanks for watching the Board Game Makeover. Signing off from sunny Seattle, Washington. We'll see you next time. Vessel here. Jason Levine. Today's question is from Bert, and his question is in regards to games like X Wing and Dice Masters and other things. He plays with his friends, and he says his friends look up gaming strategies online. And he doesn't. He tries to figure things out himself, and of course, he's going to probably lose more often because of that. And he doesn't think they're cheating. At the same time, it's a little frustrating, and he doesn't want the games to become too competitive. How do you keep games from becoming too competitive? Well, for me, like, I. I'm more in Bert's category. Like I like to figure out things on my own and say, oh, well, if I use this card and this card, they'll work together and make a nice little combo. I like to do that on my own because if not, it's like in the old days of video games where either you could play through the game and get the full experience and enjoy the game, or you could go and look at the cheat and see, well, if you do this, then you get this sword. And if you go to Zelda level two, you could get this. And it's like, well, why play the game if you're just having someone else tell you how to play the whole game? I would rather learn everything on my own. And... Competitiveness doesn't matter. If you win or lose, it really shouldn't matter. You know, so your friends got a strategy and they're using the one strategy that's the best one, but do they feel more accomplished? You feel like you're hurt because of it? You shouldn't. You should, you know, you should get enjoyment out of making your own thing and creating your own thing and trying to make something that will beat whatever the online strategy is. Yeah, really, there's a lot of different things in this regard. Uh, one, my, my, my first choice is to pick different friends. Now, not, not really, but what I mean by that is if you have people who are super competitive in the group, I don't play those games against them. I play games like X-Wing and Dice Masters. I'll find someone who's not super competitive. My daughter, um, Sam, is usually not super competitive. We both like to make cool things and go up against each other. So that's one way. That may not be possible. So then you can try drafting. You throw drafting into a game and then suddenly it can't be as competitive because they have to figure out right then and there what to do with it. That's how I play against Jason because he's much smarter than I am when it comes to these games. So I draft, which still gives him an edge, but not as much of an edge because he can't plan ahead. True. I mean, I, well, it depends. When we do Dice Masters, for example, what we always do is we, um, we usually say, okay, I'm just going to build a set. So I build the all Batman card set or the all Superman card set. So we usually build a set and we just go for a theme and... Whether or not the cards work together or not, it's more fun to kind of put a theme together and figure it out that way, I think. Well, hopefully those are tips that help you. Thanks so much for asking the question. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Hi, welcome to the 101. I've been thinking lately how much I love dungeon crawls. And I've always wondered what was the best dungeon crawl. Either sci-fi or fantasy or whatever. So I've decided to hold kind of like an elimination to see what everybody thinks is the best dungeon crawl. Now, there's a couple of rules that I have to this, okay? Number one, 
the game has to be out. So Swords and Sorcery that's coming out doesn't count. Dungeon Twister and Super Fantasy don't count. And also, they have to be out. They won't be able to count. Or even Conan. And they all have to have miniatures. So, with that said, I decided to start an elimination of 16 games that I considered the best. But I need your help. So leave in the comments or email me at NovaPrime860 at Hotmail with your thoughts and which game that you think's the best. Now this week we're going to start with Super Dungeon Explorer. Now that includes the first one and the second one here, Forgotten Kings. You can lump them together. And that will be facing off against Arcadia Quest. So which one do you think is better, Arcadia Quest or Forgotten Kings? You make the decision and I'll t tally everything up and I'll reveal it next week and then we'll move on to the next two games. So until next time, I'm Rob Warren and we'll see you soon. So I already mentioned that we're going to be t finishing up the Gamma interviews this week and also Board Game Blender. Well, we got other things that are coming up this week, several reviews from both uh, the different contributors and Sam and Z. I'll be taking a look at Millennium Blades from Level 99 Games, Knitwit, um, Sea of Clouds, Scoundrel Society, 12 Days, Little Red Riding Hood. Jason and I will be taking a look at both the expansion for Concordia, Concordia Salsa, and Web of Power. <clears throat> I would also be remiss if I didn't talk about the different podcasts there is an audio podcast that we both have an audio version of, and we also uh, do a, a video version of it. It's You're basically just listening to the audio, but there's pictures in the background, so you know what games we're talking about. That goes up in our video feed, but the audio podcast you can find at Dicetower.com, as well as many other great podcasts that are part of the Dice Tower Network. And you can find all those. In fact, on the website, there's cross-references, so you want to see which podcast talked about Blood Rage, which podcast talked about this. You can see that there. Okay, guys, thanks so much. Let's move on. Hello, Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise, here discussing some of the upcoming games featured at the recent Gamma Trade Show. Now, one of the things that I did at the show was to walk around and tweet pictures of the various games of note that I discovered there. Pretend I have my phone and I'm tweeting. Tweet. And by far, the tweet that generated the most viewer response was the one for the upcoming Dresden Files cooperative card game. Now, the Dresden Files is a series of contemporary fantasy slash mystery novels written by author Jim Butcher. And since the year 2000, 15 books have been written in this series about private investigator and wizard Harry Dresden who investigates supernatural phenomenon in Chicago. Now, there's also a Dresden television series, but the game is said to be based solely on the books. Now, the card game is being developed by Evil Hat Productions, and as scary as they sound, it's designed to be a true cooperative game. So, players will be working together, and there's no potential of a traitor to worry about. Now, one of the interesting twists about the game is that the players will share a common pool of action points among them. And this can lead to having to make some tough choices, like taking the team's action points to use for yourself, or discarding cards to do other actions or generate action points for the whole team, creating kind of a trade-off between selfish turns and unselfish turns. Now, most of the people that I've heard comment on this game mention that they're most familiar with Evil Hat Productions as being a developer of role-playing games. And they've, they have developed several other board games, such as Zeppelin Attack, Race to Adventure, and Don't Turn Your Back, but the Dresden Files cooperative card game may be their most ambitious board game project to date. So, it's going to be interesting to see if Evil Hat Productions' background in RPGs lends itself to a different flavor or perspective to this cooperative card game. Speaking of which, when will we see this cooperative card game? Well, the copy at Gamma was just a prototype, 
and the Dresden Files cooperative card game will be kickstarted, with its campaign launching this very month, April 2016. Now, will their Kickstarter retain the same swell of interest and support that the tweets and other social media announcements about the game generated? Well, time will tell. And speaking of time, join me next time for the next game from Gamma 2016 that surprised us as I continued the list of my top games from the Gamma 2016 trade show. See you then. winners. Uh, we had a contest where I asked people to send in uh, what they would like to see turned into a legacy game, and three winners were randomly chosen from uh, almost 300 entries. And so the three winners are Dustin Lloyd, Michael Walker, and Corbett Basler. Congratulations to the winners. Now, here's the deal. I'm going to be contacting you, hopefully, or you'll contact me first. Either way, one of the two will happen. And we need to get this settled right away. And if I don't get in contact with them, I actually have further down. So there's a possibility someone else may still win, maybe. And so hopefully I'll have a chance to see you guys at the F2Z headquarters. I'd like to thank them for putting on this contest. I did get a wide variety. I was like, oh, I wonder what kind of answers I'll get. The, the answer is everything from Ticket to Ride to um, just answers all over the blue. I think the answer I got the most of was Zombies, Dead of Winter. I think that was the answer I saw the most of, but honestly, people, they just picked their favorite game and then put the word legacy after it, for the most part. That's interesting. Anyway, thank you everyone for entering the contest. Maybe you'll win next time. Hello, my name is Nils Zurich's Brettspiele, as always, the best and the worst, and today we're talking about Tokaido from Funforge. Let's take a look. My favorite part on Tokaido is the theme, the whole story. This game tells a rich story of traveling in the old days through Japan. You don't have enough money to spend all your monies and you're walking from location to location like this. And whoever gets last in line has his next movement and he can stop by at any single location until he is still last person, he can take another move. So. This feeling of relaxed traveling, not having technology, money and all that stuff of the modern world. Of this theme is so strong in this game and it makes it to a totally relaxed game. Wow! Great! However, the flip side of that is you don't make really meaningful decisions. So if you're here, so a good advice is probably to stop here, spend some money. Okay, if you don't have to earn money, go here and earn some money and then go here and make a picture which means just grabbing a card but uh, if you're here and there are spots why not taking all of the spots if you don't have to spend something except for taking some stuff and getting points so meaningful decisions are not really the big point of that game and you could play that game just sitting around the table and not being focused on the game so you can talk to each other and having just a nice afternoon instead of being totally focused on the game. Yeah, that was my personal favorite best and worst for Tokaido from Funforge. My name is Niels and see you next time. Bye bye. As a reviewer, we love to tell you what we think of games, but reviewers aren't always right. Oh, who would have thought? Today I want to talk a little bit about the echo chamber effect. Now this happens not just about games, it happens about opinions on the internet, but the simple fact is the majority is not always correct, or perhaps the perceived majority. See many times when you're in a game group and you play a game and a lot of people won't like the game or a lot of people will like the game, we call that the echo chamber in a sense because everyone is like talking back and forth and group think can occur. Sure, there may be one person in a group who loves the game when everyone else hated it, or vice versa, but usually you'll come away with the impression like everyone likes this game or everyone doesn't like this game. On the internet, forums can have the same effect. Everyone who goes to a certain forum can end up liking or disliking the same games or having the same opinions on different things that happen. And we can be like, wow, the majority of people think this, and it's not necessarily the case. 
We often bring this to the thing with our own games. We'll say, this game has gone over well with every person I tried it with, therefore it has universal appeal. Well, that may or may not be true. Designers have to be really careful about this when designing a game. That when you play test it, you play test it like with people who are on different sides of the country, who like different games, because it's that critical. Because if you say, well, I took it to this one group and 65 people played it and they all liked it or they all didn't like it. Yes, but they're all in that same kind of group. And yeah, you'll have different opinions, but you might miss something that fresh eyes will miss. I mention this because we just recently played Time Stories, um, the, the Dragon the Prophecy of Dragons, the latest expansion. And I read mostly the, the reviews of the game where people said, oh, this was not as good as the others. And some people downright said it was bad. And I was like, ah. Oh. And then we went through and we played it and we loved it. For me, probably my favorite of the expansions so far. Now, of course, that's different than everyone else's opinion, or at least most people's opinions. But again, I'm looking at this quote unquote majority. I'm looking at this echo chamber and that may not be correct. And even if the majority of people like something, that doesn't mean I won't. Or, or that doesn't mean I will. And if the majority of people don't like something, doesn't mean I won't. Now, usually I can do that. We do use reviewers and we do use ratings on Board Game Geek and other places to find out exactly what the majority thinks. And if everyone says this game's bad, there's a good bet that I will also think it's bad. If everyone says a game is good, there's a good chance I'll think it's good. But it is not a guarantee. And just because a whole bunch of people loudly shout something on the internet doesn't make it true. You can go into the world of politics to see that one come to, to fruition, but that's the farthest I'll talk about politics. What I mean is opinions are everywhere. Everyone has an opinion and people are going to loudly proclaim them. And when you see a bunch of people loudly saying the same thing on the internet, you will be like, oh, I guess that must be true. No, that doesn't mean it's true. It just means a bunch of those loud people think it's true. I am one of those loud people. I am one of the loud people who gives you my opinions of a game. I'll say, this game is awful. This game is amazing. But take that with a grain of salt. Just because I and every other reviewer might say a game's good, you may still not like, for example, Pandemic Legacy. Just because I and a bunch of other reviewers pan something, you may love Munchkin. You are not necessarily tied to the opinions of the echo chamber. Think for yourself to some degree, and don't worry when everyone else dislikes something you like. It doesn't make you odd or different unusual. It just means you know your own tastes. Hello, Internet. Welcome back to The Game Plan. So recently, we've been talking about travel games, and, I got, and I've gone over my 7-year-old sister's top 5 and my 11-year-old brother's top 5. Today, we're going to go over my top 5. And let's see if there's some crossover. Number 5 on my list is Jaipur, a quick 2-player trading game. I like this game because it's quick, easy to play, and it's also easy to teach others. This is the first crossover with my sister's list, and I like playing the game specifically with her. And it's also super portable. Whenever we go somewhere, we decide to put the tokens and all the cards into a plastic bag, and then away we go. Number four is Diamonds, a trick-taking game by Mike Fitzgerald. This is one of my favorite card games of all time. I mainly like it because of all of the interesting de decisions that you have to make over the course of the game. And come on, who doesn't like the shiny diamonds? It's a lot of game for a small box. Number three is Tiny Epic Galaxies, a mini 4X engine building game. It's number three on this list because there's many interesting decisions that you have to make over the course of the game. You have to manage between ship deployment to different planets, resource management, and upgrading your empire. And also, it's super portable. It's tiny, and a little epic. Number two is yet another crossover, this one with my brother's list, the spy-themed word game Codenames. This game is great because everybody in my family loves word games, and because of the team aspect, we're able to split up to, into teams, making the ages even, so everybody can play competitively. And my number one travel game is, drumroll please, Port Royal which also happens to be a crossover with my brother's list, which is a little unusual because we don't usually agree on anything, but in this case we've agreed on two travel games now. The special powers in this game are great, but the main reason I love this game is because of the push your luck. On every flip of the card there's a lot of tension. 
Will I bust or will I live to see another card? On our vacation in a couple weeks, I'm excited to play this game with the new expansion. So if you're going on vacation, you might want to consider some of these games. What are your favorite travel games? Leave them in the comment section below. Until next time, this is Andrew Cohen, and this has been The Game Plan. Welcome to Playing the News, where I look at the news and see what games come to mind. In the Netherlands this week, yet another big retailer went bankrupt, opening its doors this week for a final farewell sale. On the other hand, small companies seem to do great. So that is exactly what we will do this week. We will start our own little startup, make, sell and deliver potions to all those castles in our world. This week we are playing Broom Service. Our business plan simply cannot fail. We ask our friends to help us out. We've got friends who can make potions, who can bring us places, who can deliver and sell the potions for us and the weather fairy will clear the skies. Because they are our friends, they will work for free. We can even ask them to put in a little extra effort to give us even better rewards. If this all sounds too good to be true, well, it is. Your friends are so helpful, they're even helping out your competitors. So. Every round you secretly choose four friends to ask for a favor. If it is a small cowardly favor, no problem, you'll get that immediately. But if it's a big bold favor, your friends don't have enough time to do that for everyone. So they'll only do that for the last person who asks them, leaving the rest empty handed. Meanwhile you are running around a beautiful colorful board, try to rake in as many points as you can. Time and again, it's very exciting to see if you're able to predict what your competitors are doing or be totally surprised by their new plans. The board is double-sided, so you have a family version and a more deeper experience of the game and I highly recommend it. Broom service. Hey folks, today I want to show you this case that I found when I was at the container store. I love going to the container store, love the different things I find there. But I found this case, and this case was for uh, photographs, which uh, most people don't have as many photographs anymore. But I thought, I wonder if it would work for card games. So I tried it out. In this case here, which, by the way, you can see can be carried pretty easily like that. But in this case are these smaller plastic card cases. And each of these opens like this. And inside you have different card games. So I thought, hey, I'll make this a case that I can hold games that I might take to conventions or things like that. Now some of the rule books were just a little bit too wide for these cases so I have them outside they fit in the case fine. So what do I have in here? I have Ultimate Werewolf, I have the Bottle Imp, uh, here I have David and Goliath, a great trick-taking game. I have One Night Ultimate Werewolf which I believe I've split into two. And then I have um, Port Royale, I got Two Rooms and a Boom which I managed to fit in here. That shows how big that box was for that game. Wasn't necessary. Uh, here we have Archaeology the Card Game. Um, here, Welcome to the Dungeon. And here we have Cat Tower. And of course, not to be superseded, we have Super Rhino, which fit into one. And then finally, one of the level 99 games. Um, so all these fit in here. and I might change them in and out. Now, what will make this horrific to some of you is the fact that I got rid of the boxes for all these games. These are now in here. These are these games. They're just the way they are. But I think this is a good selection of games. I don't really need them all in boxes. This is something I would take to bigger game meetups and or conventions because these are the kind of games that will probably likely be played there. And this fits really nicely. I'm thinking about getting a second one of these and having case one and case two. It's not perfect because I would prefer that they made the cases either smaller so the cards fit in better or it's not or taller so I could put the cards in like this. It doesn't work out perfectly but it does work out well. The cards do slide around in them a bit so you'll notice that many of the times I have them in rubber bands inside there. But I'm really impressed with this case. I like it a lot. I'm not sure where you where it's where you can buy it but I know that you certainly can get it at the container store. 
it's a pretty cool thing to have. And that's it, another board game breakfast. All right, well, I'm excited. Like I said, there's a lot of cool things coming out this week. Don't forget, really, if you like board game breakfast, then come back this Thursday for Board Game Blender, the show that Zeig puts out. It's very similar, except it has his spin on things. It has a straight up theme. You will enjoy it. For the rest of you, I will see you at my live Q&A tonight at nine or 10 o'clock, sorry. Uh, until next time, I'm Tom Basil. This has been Board Game Breakfast, and you're watching The Dice Down. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.